works with many indigenous communities that live close to the land and understand the deep interconnections that create the web of life. The women in these communities are standing up to big forces to protect the forests, rivers, and mountains. Although their lives have the smallest footprints on this earth, uh, they suffer the most from the rapidly degrading ecology. Uh, for example, many Adivasi communities protect their sacred groves, or as they call Sarna Sthals, with their lives that stand out as hot spots of biodiversity in a landscape that is desertifying. Like Native American communities raise the slogan of Ni Vichoni or water is life, forest dwelling communities of central India raise the slogan Jangal se hai pani or pani se hai jeevan, which means forests give us water, water gives us life. These people are the best custodians of all of life's diversity on the planet. Wade has traveled to the far corners of the world and lived among many indigenous communities in numerous countries. He shares his stories with passion in a way that transports us all to these places. Wade's talks bring life to the truth that every culture is unique and precious on its own. As Wade says, other cultures are not failed attempts at being you. They are unique manifestations of the human spirit. And we are here to hear from Wade about these unique manifestations of the human spirit, their wisdom, and how we can collectively deal with the challenges that confront us all in these times of climate crisis. If you have any questions, please mention in the chat below. Um, welcome, Wade. Uh, thank you so much for being here today with us. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Swati and Santosh. I, I uh, was very so touched by your the introductory remarks and by the film. Uh, and it, it's just a real honor for me to be with all of you this morning or wherever you are in the world. Um, and to su support aid and to ask you to support aid. I mean, these sorts of grassroots organizations um, take your support and stretch it in ways that perhaps a larger NGO or a government agency is not capable of doing. So if you um, make some small contribution, you can really change a life. And so I really, it, it's a pleasure to be with you. And, and Swati asked me to address this sort of interface between indigenous people and the climate crisis. And of course, as an anthropologist uh, and looking at the problem through the anthropological lens, you know, the kind of the role of anthropology is to look beneath the surface of things. And in that sense, um, what I'd like to do this morning is try to put this climate crisis in a kind of global perspective, um, very much playing off what both Swati and Sanush said is that the societies that played no role in the creation of this crisis are not only being impacted by it more severely, but also by the terms of references of their own worldviews are often doing more to attempt to mitigate um, the impact and to defend their own small piece of the earth. So that's sort of a bit of a preamble. I'm just gonna go to a, a screen share and um, begin with a kind of a, a, a wider perspective that will then bring us down to, to culture, uh, to climate change. You know, I think all of us can understand that one of the great pleasures of travel um, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel their past in the wind, uh, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that as we gather around this kind of virtual fireplace this morning, in the Amazon, jaguar shaman are still journeying beyond the Milky Way. And that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning. And then in the Himalaya of India and Tibet, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma is to remember the central revelation of anthropology. And that is the idea, as Swati said, 
that the world in which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder on the slopes of Shomolungma, an eagle hunter in central Kazakhstan, or indeed a thunderhoof shaman in Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of thinking, other ways of knowing, critically other ways of orienting yourself in physical, spiritual, and, and ecological space. And that's an idea that if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now together, the myriad of peoples of the world make up a kind of a, a social web of life uh, that envelops a planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is a biological web of life that you know so well as a biosphere. And in an early book, I coined the term ethnosphere to kind of try to create a organizing principle around this idea of the human legacy. And I define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuitions, inspirations, myths and memories brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the emblem and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative and innovative species. But just as the biosphere is being severely impacted with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. Very few biologists, for example, would suggest that, at least in terrestrial ecosystems, that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund or destined for extinction. That would be an extreme view, to say the least. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of this, of course, is language loss. When each of us were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on earth. Now a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. I wrote in that book that every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born by absolute academic consensus amongst linguists, fully half today are not being whispered into the ears of children. They're moribund. They're on the edge of extinction. Now, there are many people who say, well, wait a minute, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? My answer to that is always to say, what a brilliant idea. But let's make that universal language Mongolian. Let's make it Inuktitut, the language of the Inuit. Let's make it Quechua, the language of the Andean farmers, and you suddenly begin to feel, particularly as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry, or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet, terrible as it is to say, that plight is the fate of somebody somewhere on earth every two weeks, because on average, every fortnight, somewhere, an elder, man or woman, passes away and carries with them into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, the tragedy in all of this is not just that it's happening so quickly in a single generation, in which by any kind of ethnographic definition, we are losing, if those statistics hold, not just individuals, but fully half of humanity's social, ecological, spiritual knowledge. This, of course, doesn't have to happen, but its poignancy is compounded by the fact 
that it's transpiring in the very same generation in which science in the brilliant guise of genetics has finally proven to be true, something that philosophers have always hoped to be true. And that is the fact that we are brothers and sisters, literally. And I don't mean that in the spirit of what we jokingly call hippie ethnography in Canada. No, I mean quite literally over the last generation, genetics has shown that the endowment, the genetic endowment of humanity is an utter continuum. Race is a total fiction. It's an utter social construct. It has nothing to do with biology whatsoever. All human beings are cut from the same genetic cloth. In fact, we're all descendants of the same handful of hominids who walked out of Africa some 70,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary diaspora, a Hegira 2,500 human generations in duration, 40,000 years, which carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important revelation. If you accept that scientific truth, it means by definition that every culture shares the same genius, the same mental acuity, the same raw human potential. And critically, whether that human genius is invested in, in industrial development or technological wizardry, which has been the great success of the West, or by contrast, placed into the subtleties of spiritual understanding, the unraveling of the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy when it comes to culture. That old Victorian idea that we somehow, you know, invoking Darwin, that somehow cultures evolved, that somehow we went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London has been absolutely debunked by modern science and been shown to have been an artifact of the 19th century as distant from our lives and as irrelevant to our lives as the notion of Anglican clergymen in that era that the earth was but 6,000 years old in this kind of stunning affirmation of the interconnectedity uh, connection of humanity, uh, science has come to the fore to prove the validity and truth of the great intuition of social anthropology inspired by Franz Boas. And that of course is cultural relativism. And what this means as Swati mentioned that the other peoples of the world are not failed attempts at being us. They're certainly not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture by definition is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those answers collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with all of the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. In a nutshell, it comes down to this. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. You know, but the question becomes, what do we do about this? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area, for example, of high species endemism, you can seek out to make a protected area, a national park, a nature preserve, or whatever. But you can't do that with culture. You know, culture is not static. We can't sequester indigenous people in some kind of zoological park. Not only would that be absurd, it would be morally uh, irreprehensible. Change, of course, is the one constant in culture. All peoples everywhere are always dancing with new possibilities for life. So as we pondered this dilemma um, about bringing this extraordinary crisis to the attention of the world, when I first was recruited to the National Geographic um, uh, uh, in 1999, um, you know, we thought, well, you know, polemics are never persuasive. Um, academics um, never inspire. Politicians only follow, they never lead, but storytellers change the world. 
And so what we decided to do is rather than trying to preach to people what they should think or how they should behave, we thought it might be more effective to embark on a series of journeys to the ethnosphere, if you will, that would reveal to our extraordinarily large readership and viewership at the National Geographic, the greatest storytelling platform in the world, um, the true wonder of culture as brought into being by the human imagination. So not going out as so many ethnographic filmmakers have done to celebrate the exoticism of the other. No, we went to find stories that in the most beautiful way demonstrated this great lesson of anthropology. So for example, we began in Polynesia, the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the Southern seas. And I was fortunate to be able to sail with a good friend of mine, Nainoa Thompson, on this incredible vessel, Hokalea, named after the sacred star of Hawaii. And even today, the sailors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society sailing on the Hokalea, which was literally designed and, and built based on the drawings that Joseph Banks uh, scribbled into his journals as he traveled across the Pacific with James Cook in the 18th century. Even today, the sailors of the Polynesian Voyaging Society can name 250 stars in the night sky. They can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching the reverberation of waves across the hull of their vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same perspicacity with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who in the darkness of the hull of the vessel can sense as many as five different swells moving through the sacred canoe, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and, be, and can be followed with the same ease that a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most amazing thing about this tradition is that it was based on dead reckoning. And dead reckoning means that you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. Now it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on a long oceanic voyage that caused most European transports to hug the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before the Christian era, from an ancient civilization called Lapita, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. Within a thousand years, they reached from New Caledonia and New Guinea all the way to Tonga and Samoa. And then the migration stopped for a thousand years. The written language was lost but not understanding of the wind, the sea, the signs of the stars. And then it began to move again, 4,000 kilometers across the Pacific to the Marquesas, southeast to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, northwest to Hawaii, and finally around the time of the first crusade, reaching the islands now known as New Zealand, then of course to the Polynesians known as Eotearoa. And that meant, if you think about it, that in a society that lacked the written word at that time, on a long multi-week oceanic voyage, the wayfinder or navigator had to remember every sign of the stars, every sign of the wind, every change of direction, the signs of the sea, the moon, the sun, all of that had to be remembered, not just in fact, but also in sequence of acquisition. And if that, that, that lineage of knowledge uh, was, was lost, uh, the voyage could end in disaster. And so I really mean it when I say that if you take all the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. So once we go beneath the surface of things with cultures, we can 
ask some important questions. As we move, for example, from the ocean into the greatest forest, the Amazon basin, a forest the size of the face of the full moon. And we come into the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, people who cognitively do not distinguish the color blue from the color green, because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. The people who believe that they came up the Milk River from the east in ancestral time in the belly of sacred serpents were drawn in the canoes behind the anaconda. And when we begin to look at the way they live in the forest, we can reflect powerfully on how differently we live. Now, you know, it, it, it's important, again, going back to the theme of this talk, climate change, that again, as Swati mentioned, climate change may have become humanity's problem, but critically, it was not caused by humanity. It came as a direct consequence of a particular worldview that has now for over 300 years, a short period of time, but potentially fatal for the earth itself, three centuries in which Western society has consumed the ancient sunlight of the world. Now, again, going back to this idea of cultural myopia, all societies share that dreadful trait that has haunted humanity since the dawn of consciousness. I mean, many indigenous societies, their name for themselves will translate uh, the people, the implication being that the blokes over the hill are savages beyond the pale. The, the word barbarian in English comes from the Greek word barbarous. And if you didn't uh, speak the Greek language, you didn't exist. When Herodotus came back to Athens, 400 years before the Christian era and had the audacity to say to Plato that there was something interesting going on over there in this place called Persia. Plato wanted him banned from Athens for the audacity of saying that anything anywhere could be of interest save that that was to be found in their nation state city of Athens. So this cultural myopic view of the world which is a curse of humanity uh, has no place in a world interconnected and a world of multicultural aspirations seeking pluralism. But again, if we look at our world in the West critically for a moment, we can understand where this all came from. Look, in the Renaissance and slipping into the Enlightenment a hundred years later, European society was desperate to free itself from the tyranny of absolute faith, just as it freed the individual from the collective, which for better or for worse was a sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And when Descartes came along and said that all that exists is mind material, in a single gesture, he deanimated the world. As we swept away all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, we also tragically swept away metaphor, as science, as Saul Bellow said, made a house cleaning of belief. And the idea that the flight of a bird could have meaning was redu reduced to ridicule. And the world came to be seen as a kind of stage set upon which only the human drama unfolded. Plants and animals, natural features were just props on the stage set, the central drama of which was purely the human um, being. And that had huge consequences because it, in, if we deanimate the world, we have a different view of it. Listen, I was born in Canada, raised to believe that the glorious forests of British Columbia existed to be cut. That was a foundation of the ideology of scientific forestry that I learned in school and practiced as a young forester and logger in the woods. That made me fundamentally different than my friends amongst the Kwakwakawak, a First Nations group that believes the forest, the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven, the cannibal spirits that live at the north end of the world. Well, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. I was raised in Canada to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock, dead, ready to be mined. That made me different from my godchildren in the mountains of the Andes, raised to believe that a mountain is an Apu deity that will direct their destiny. Again, the issue isn't 
who's right and who's wrong. The interesting thing is how the belief system itself mediates the interaction between the human population and the natural resource with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint. If you are raised to believe that a mountain is an inert pile of rock, you do not hesitate to tear it apart, to seek the ore that lies within it. If you're raised to believe that it is a sacred deity, you most assuredly um, do. And so as we look around the world, as we see that the kind of triumph of secular materialism, which is the very conceit of modernity, appears to be dominating everywhere, it's ubiquitous. It's important for us all to take a step back and recognize that its power and ubiquity does not imply that in human history, it has been the norm, quite to the contrary. If you look at indigenous cultures all around the world, their fundamental model uh, for interacting with the natural world is not an extractive model. They have not deanimated the world. Their interactions are all based on reciprocity, some, some elaborate interpretation of a very fundamental principle. The earth owes its bounty to human beings, but human beings owe their fidelity to the world. The world can only exist because it is filtered through the human imagination. Plants and animals are not seen as mere props on a stage upon which only the human drama unfolds. Amongst the Barasana, their most profound spiritual intuition, in fact, is the idea and the conviction that plants and animals are only people in another dimension of reality. And as we explore these societies and celebrate their poetics, what you begin to see is that that fundamental idea uh, can become extraordinarily beautifully um, elaborated through ritual, through belief, through uh, mythology, but it's always the same idea. Human beings are not the problem, we are the solution because the glory of the earth can only become manifest through our eyes. And yet that gives us a profound obligation and responsibility for the well-being of the planet. And we see this time and time again. And in ritual, for example, in the Northwest Amazon, amongst the Barasana and the Makuna, the Tanimukos, the Tucanos, the so-called peoples of the Anaconda, who live in these great longhouses, which are seen to be the model of the kindred, the, 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 the womb of the kindred, but hovering over the entire planet is a universal maloka anchored in the sacred sites. And when the communities come together um, in ritual, it's to reaffirm all of that. These are societies of wisdom traditions. These are societies that have social mechanisms that facilitate not uh, a war, but peace and exchange, not the least of which is an extraordinary marriage rule that says that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply watch, wait, listen, and one day learn to speak. And in these great rituals mediated by ingestion of, of Yahe, this potent entheogenic or psychoactive substance famous in the Northwest Amazon, the men don the feathers of regalia, but these feathers aren't decorative. The, the feathers are literally the rays of the sun. There is no word for time in the Barasana language. Um, there is no notion of wasting time or taking time or precious time. And the people move in and out of the spirit realm with ease and impunity. And so when they go on their journeys to revisit the sacred sites of the ancestors, they don't go there in a metaphorical sense. They literally go there. They believe they fly there in the, the magic of trance. They are not symbols of the ancestors. They are the ancestors. And of course, all of this comes together in mythology. And as we begin to examine their myths. And remember that myths aren't old stories. Ultimately myths, and I shouldn't ever have to say this to an audience from the subcontinent, 
We just have to look at the scriptures, the Vedas. Myths become moral charters. They're, they're aspirational. They are saying how a human population should live. And as we dissect the mythology of the peoples of the Anaconda, what we discover is that the myths in effect are nothing more or less than complex land management plans that dictate exactly how indigenous people can live in that immense tropical forest without tearing it apart, without doing it harm. Now these notions of, of the interaction between a human population and landscape can be distilled in what I call sacred geography. And again, I, I'm not talking in hippie ethnography. I mean, we really need to pay attention to societies that have this sense that the earth is alive. If we go for a moment, for example, into the youngest mountain chain on earth, the Andes of uh, South America, here the earth is alive. Landslides, earthquakes, um, uh, uh, frosts that arrive in a minute, that can destroy the agricultural labor of a year. The people can see the clouds condensed on the sides of mountains, um, precipitating the rain that brings fertility to the soils. It is a living dynamic landscape. And so the, the people have a very strong sense of reciprocity in all of their inter interactions, not just spiritual reciprocity with the Apu deities, but all interactions between people are based on reciprocity. There is no currency. The exchange of labor and goods was all based on reciprocal, reciprocal uh, relationships, never spoken about and never forgotten. And these ideas become played out in these magnificent rituals. In a community, for example, outside of Cusco, the ancient capital of the Incan Empire, called Chinchero, where I've been working for almost 40 years. This is my godson, one of my many. Uh, and and uh, once each year, an amazing ritual takes place. The fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And I'm proud to say that Armando was selected one year to become what's known as a Wailaka, which is a pejorative term in Quechua that refers to a woman who doesn't do her duties properly. But for that one ceremonial day known as the movimiento, the wailaka, the boy transformed into the feminine, must lead all able-bodied men of the community. Attendance is mandatory on a run, but it's not your ordinary run. You begin at 11,500 feet uh, in the plaza of the community, and then you run down 2,000 feet to the base of the sacred mountain and to Kirka, only to run to 16,000 feet. And the entire circumference of the run, which marks the boundaries of the community, is marked by holy mounds of earth, where the wailaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountaintop, where coca leaves are given to Pachamama, libations of alcohol to the wind. But the metaphor is so beautiful and clear you go into the mountain as an individual, but through sacrifice, which in English origins means to make sacred, through pure exhaustion, you fuse as one into a community that once again has reaffirmed both its ownership of the land, but more importantly, its responsibilities for that land. And I, I undertook this run at the age of 48 in what my wife called was one of my many midlife crises. And I was the oldest man and the only outsider uh, ever to do this ritual. And I can say I only got through the day by chewing more coca leaves than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. But what really got me through is that all the children I had baptized and baptism, you have to understand is not the imposition of Christian ideology. This is a purely syncretic world in which the 500 years of Christianity has been absorbed by pa uh, pa uh, pre-Columbian ideas to question what is Christian and what is pre-Columbian, as my friend Nilda Kalanaupa once told me, is just to give us a headache. The Christianity is very much part of the people. Uh, and so I baptized uh, many children, which really meant establishing a relationship with their parents, an economic relationship. And I had uh, put so many kids through school and um, bought them families cows, you can't even imagine. And 
all of these children came uh, out um, and ran with me the whole day and looked after me and they just weren't allowed going to let anything happen to their cash cow but again that was the day that i was formally absorbed and welcomed and, and named by the community as a member of the community now these localized rituals in peru become pan andean and great events like the coyariti where once each year as the pleiades reemerge in the sky tens of thousands of andean peoples from all over southern peru and bolivia converge in a sacred valley known as the Sinicara, which is dominated by three tongues of a glacier called the Colcapunca. Now this is a site that obviously has been a pilgrimage destination for thousands of years. It was of course co-opted by the Catholic Church at the time of the conquest. An apparition of Christ was said to exist there. So the ritual today is a perfect expression of that 500 years of Catholic faith together with thousands of years of pre-Columbian intuitions. So the essence of the ritual is that the crosses of the local communities are carried on the backs as Christ carried the cross through a series of stations up to the high mountain valley. Um, here by day, great celebrations occur, but the critical moment is as in the shadow of Ausungati, the most sacred Apu or mountain deity of the entire Incan empire, the Pablitos who represent order and control carry the crosses into the ice where the crosses are planted in the body of Pachamama, the earth goddess for 48 hours to absorb her energy. And then they are carried back down the mountain to be returned to the communities themselves to literally carry the power of the earth back to the mountain. And here's where it gets very poignant. Always, traditionally, the penultimate stage of this multi-day pilgrimage was the moment when men would ship from the glaciers blocks of ice that they would carry back to the communities so that the elders who were physically unable to make the trek to the mountain could have the mountain brought to them so that they could take part in the ceremony. This shipping of the ice and carrying it back to the community was a final act that wove together the, 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 the divine um, uh, cycle of, of ritual that was this remarkable pilgrimage. But in recent years, having witnessed the recession of the glaciers, the indigenous people have decided to stop that phase of the ritual. Why? because they think the recession of the glaciers is their fault. And this is a critical element and issue when we talk about indigenous people and climate change. Look, for most people in the West, climate change is either a, a technical challenge, an economic opportunity, for some a political uh, a football, for some even a scientific debate. But for people who believe all around the world, from the islands of the Pacific to the high Arctic, as we'll see in a moment, that they themselves are responsible for the well being of the earth. If the earth is ill, it's their fault. They've let down the side. And so for indigenous people, it's not simply a threat to their uh, material well being, as it can well be, but it is a profoundly psychological. Uh, spiritual and existential crisis. And that's why it becomes so poignant when we see in a moment like this, what does it mean for this tradition to decide it will no longer do a vital part of a ritual? That involves a sacrifice far greater in terms of reference of that culture than certainly anything that we are doing in North America to mitigate the impacts of this um, uh, phenomena. Now, if we, if we stay for a moment in South America and we come north to Colombia in the extraordinary mountains of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, the highest coastal mountain range on earth that rises to almost 20,000 feet right out of the beaches of the Caribbean, we'll be able to visit a world untouched effectively in a sense by the Spaniards. The only place in a bloodstained continent where the indigenous people were never utterly dominated by the European invaders. 
This is a homeland of the elder brothers. Four societies, the Kankwano, who are more assimilated, but the Wiwa and the Kogi and the Arawakos all speak Shibshan languages. They can't speak to each other, they speak to each other in Spanish. But those languages are the languages of the Muisca, the great civilization of central Colombia at the time of the conquest, but they're the direct descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization, which carpeted the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia among the finest goldsmiths in the world. In the wake of the conquest, the survivors fled into the upper reaches of the mountains where for over 300 years, they remained in isolation. Uh, and in that period of time, their society was transformed from a warlike nation into a devotional culture of peace. To this day, they are ruled by a ritual priesthood. And the training for the priesthood is extraordinary. The young acolytes are taken from their families at the age of two and three, sequestered in a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years to nine year periods chosen to mimic the nine months they spend in their natural mother's womb. Now metaphorically, they're in the womb of the great mother. And for those 18 years, they are trained in the Baroque religiosity of the religious tradition, which maintains amongst other things that their rituals and prayers literally maintain the ecological and cosmic balance of the world. Again, we see that people are not the problem, they are the solution. And after 18 years in which the world only exists as an abstraction, where the individual on a ritual diet is never allowed to leave the immediate surroundings of the sacred temple where his training occurs, suddenly when the training is over, is taken on what they call a journey to the heart of the world. And the priest who has trained him goes along. And with every step, as the journey takes them from the ice of the high summits back to the sea, where every ripple in the landscape resonates with mythological and spiritual significance, as they see suddenly the glory of the world that for all of their lives has only existed as an idea, an abstraction. They've only been told how beautiful it is. Now they suddenly see a sunrise. They see the beauty of the landscape and the priest who has trained them as they step down into the sea, the vulva of the universe. The priest who has trained them steps back and you see it is as I've promised you all these years. The earth is that beautiful and it's yours to protect. And they speak in full paragraphs of our need to change our ways. They call themselves the elder brothers and they dismiss the rest of humanity as the younger brothers who have violated the world. And even though many of their sacred sites on the coast are now dominated by urban centers, that doesn't keep them from doing what they do best. Ritual payments at the mouth of the mighty Magdalena payments to the river. They literally believe that there is no difference between the blood that flows through your veins and the water that flows through a river. And in this, of course, they are quite correct. All of us will die and the blood in our veins will become part of the hydrological cycle, the endless cycle of, of evaporation, uh, condensation and precipitation that brings water and life to all sentient creatures in the world. They speak about our need not just to have physical peace. This is a mamo, one of the sun priests, a great friend of mine, who told me in words that I passed along to the Nobel laureate, uh, President Juan Manuel Santos, um, as he made me an honorary citizen of Colombia. I shared with him what Mamo Camillo had said to me uh, in the wake of the violence and the civil war in Colombia. Peace won't matter, he said, if it's only an excuse for the three sides to come together to make uh, war on the natural world. It's time to make peace with all of nature. So again, this idea from anthropology of looking beneath the surface of things, we then have to ask ourselves, why is it that we are so dismissive of the other? For example, were I to ask you in India or in America, anywhere to name the great religions of the world, what would you say? Hinduism, Islam, Sikh religion, 
um, 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 uh, um, Christianity, um, Buddhism, whatever, what continent do we always leave out? Sub-Saharan Africa, the tacit assumption being that people of West Africa had no religion. Well, of course they did. And voodoo is not a black magic cult um, as it is always depicted in the West. It's simply a distillation of very profound religious ideas that were born in Africa and came over to the Americas during the tragic era of the slavery era. Um, um, voodoo is simply a fall word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. And in many ways, the voodoo faith is the most democratic in the sense that the individual has direct access to the divine through spirit possession, which is not some kind of psychological pathology as it's often described in the West. It's in fact the hand of divine grace. It's a moment when the spirit summoned by the music, the drums, the power of the chant, rise from beneath great water to momentarily settle and displace the soul of the living human being such that for that brief shining moment, human and God become one and the same. That's why Haitians and Africans often say, you know, you white people go to church and speak about God, we dance in the temple and become God. And because you are taken by the spirit, you cannot be harmed. You are the God. Uh, and that's why you see these theatrical gestures here in Africa before a fetish cutting into the body to show the power and strength of the divine or more profoundly here in Haiti, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, uh, handling burning embers with impunity, a rather astonishing example of the body's, the mind's ability to affect the body uh, that bears it when uh, catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. We think of voodoo as something evil, um, really uh, simply because of history. The fact that Haiti was the only independent black nation on earth, the fact that Haiti used to buy shipments of slaves destined for the American South and grant them freedom. The fact that the US Marine Corps occupied Haiti in the 1920s and stayed for 30 years, 20 years, and everybody above the rank of sergeant got a book contract. And the books had names like Cannibal Cousins and Black Baghdad and Voodoo Fire in Haiti, the White King of Lagonave, the uh, Puritan in Voodoo Land. And these books were filled with children bred for the cauldron and pins and needles and voodoo dolls that don't exist and, and, and zombies crawling out of the grave to attack people, none of which exist. And of course, those books which gave rise to the RKO movies of the 1940s, Night of the Living Dead, Zombies on Broadway, essentially said to the American people during the era of, slave, of segregation that any country where such abominations occurred could only find its redemption through military occupation. And again, this is, again, going back to the anthropological lens. Anthropology doesn't call for an extreme relativism, as if every trait of culture must be defended simply because it exists, as if you would defend the heinous acts of the Nazis because they had a weird ideology and a religion and a way of thinking. No, anthropology never calls for the elimination of judgment. It calls only for the suspension of judgment. So the very judgments that we're ethically and morally obliged to make as human beings can be informed ones. And the anthropological lens is most useful when it's shone upon a cultural tradition like African religion, um, which, uh, for, about which people have said terrible things and of which they have no understanding whatsoever. So, you know, the question is what, what kind of world do we really want to live in and what's causing the, the collapse of this remarkable cultural diversity. You know, we have this idea that these societies are, you know, quaint and colorful perhaps, but destined to fade away as if, as if by natural law. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture. Change is no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. In every case, these are not delicate, frail societies. These are dynamic living peoples, not drifting away from history, but by being driven out of history by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can surely be the facilitators of cultural survival. So let's slip for a moment into the forests of Borneo and come into the encampments of the last nomads of Southeast Asia.
the incredible society we know as the Penan. Now, nomadic societies are profoundly different. Think for a moment, how do you measure wealth in a world in which there is a disincentive to accumulate anything? In the Penan culture, wealth is defined as a strength of social relations between people, because if those relations fray, everybody suffers. Sharing is such an involuntary reflex that there is no word for thank you in their language. I once gave a cigarette to an old Penan woman and in my amazement watched as she tore apart the individual strands of tobacco to distribute equitably this, uh, the strands of tobacco to each hut in the encampment, rendering the product useless, but honoring her obligation to share. And in the Penan society, as in so many um, societies that do not have the written word, you know, we think of the writing as this great advance of civilization, which it was, but as a device, it's designed to dull memory. In oral traditions, the memory remains acute and the sounds of the forest become like a vocabulary written on the wind. And oral traditions have a kind of dialogue with the natural world in the same way that we can hear the voice of a character when we read a Victorian novel, so too the Penan can hear in a sense the voices of the animals. But sadly, by the time I got to Sarawak in the 1980s, the sounds of the forest had become the sounds of machinery. At a time when people were talking all around the world of deforestation in the Amazon, Brazil produced 1.3% of the world's tropical log exports. Sarawak uh, produced 45%, much of it from the homeland of the Penan. Individual Chinese logging companies crushing the forest with as many as 2,500 massive bulldozers. Uh, rivers that once ran clear, so heavy with silt that it seemed as if half of Sarawak was slipping away to the South China Sea, where the freighters hung light on the horizon, ready to fill their holds with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Women reduced to servitude and prostitution in these industrial camps along the banks of the rivers. Children suffering from ailments never known in traditional culture. Men humiliated every day, finally rising up in a quixotic gesture, blowpipes against bulldozers, no match for the power of the Malaysian state, and in a single generation, a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, was crushed along with the force that gave it birth. Now that's an example of egregious industrial policy destroying culture. But let's examine the roots of industrial ideas for a moment by going to the opposite end of the imaginative uh, a spectrum in, of humanity. And that lands us in one of the oldest civilizations on earth, the Aboriginal people of Australia. We know from studies of the Y chromosome that the ancestors of the Aborigines were the first humans to walk out of Africa. It was actually the discovery of an individual uh, in India that allowed geneticists to trace this uh, ancient migration that in 5,000 years carried them all the way across and across the water that even then separated New Guinea from the most parsimonious continent. And then they went walking. And in time, they established 10,000 clan territories, all linked by a single idea. And that idea is the dreaming. Now, when the British arrived in Australia, they had no understanding of the place. What they saw was a land that was populated sparsely by people who looked strange, who had a simple material technology, but what really offended the British about the Aboriginals is that they had no interest in improving their material lot. And since improvement and material progress was the very essence of European thought at the time, the British in their inimitable way concluded that the Aboriginal people of Australia were not human at all, and they began to shoot them. And as recently as 1902 in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in parliament in Melbourne as to whether Aboriginal people were human or not. In the 1950s, when I was born, ranchers in Australia 
had quotas as to how many Aboriginals they could shoot with impunity who trespassed on their ranches. In the 1960s, when I was a schoolboy, a book used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia included the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife in the country. But what was really going on here was a devotional philosophy beyond the reach of the British imagination, and that was the dreaming. And the dreaming wasn't a dream. It was the idea that there is no such thing as time, and there's no such thing as present, past, or future. In not one of the 670 dialects of Australia was there a word for those four notions, time, past, present, future. There was only the eternal now, the now of the dreaming, in which the world at your feet both existed in the phenomenological sense, but was always waiting to be born into the realm of the dreaming. And the whole point of life for that civilization was the antithesis of progress, it was stasis. The goal in life wasn't to change anything, on the contrary, it was to do the ritual gestures along the song lines, which were the trajectories walked by the ancestors at the time of creation when they sang the world into existence, to do the gestures and ritual activities along the song lines that were conceived to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It would be as if all European scientific thought and energy had been invested in the quest to prune the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep that garden exactly as it was at the time of creation. Now again, I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong. Clearly, if humanity as a whole had followed that intellectual spiritual tra trajectory, that spiritual devotion, we would not have put a man on the moon. On the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the life of uh, support systems of the entire planet. So 50,000 years from now, which intellectual spiritual intuition, in fact, if we're still around, will have been seen as to have been the wisest and the most sustainable. Now, finally, just um, pursuing this idea of what causes threats to culture, it's not just industrial, it's often ideological be it the ubiquitous cult of the modern, or indeed the Marxist mania of Beijing. This is a woman, a nun, at a temple in Cambodia whose feet and hands have been severed from her body during the era of Pol Pot for the crime of pursuing her spiritual beliefs. An image here of Tibet, a place I spend a great deal of time. And of course, Tibet has suffered enormously and famously when the, the 14th Dalai Lama as a young man met Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong incidentally being the human being responsible for the death and murder of more of his own people than Hitler and Stalin put together. When Mao Zedong famously said to his holiness that all religion was poison, uh, his holiness knew what to expect. And when the jackboot of the Red Guard finally stomped into Lhasa, taking over Tibet in 1959, and the Dalai Lama had to flee to Darjeeling into the hands of the Indians, a blessing of the Indian people, uh, two, uh, uh, 6,000 temples were destroyed in Tibet. As many as a million, perhaps more people were killed for their religious faith. Well, what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of China? Well, it's all distilled, as you well know, in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He just meant that negative things were part of the stream of existence. They happened. They were not going to go away. Evil would not be defeated. The second of the Noble Truths was the idea that the cause of suffering was ignorance. By that, the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. A third of the noble truths was a revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth, of course, was the delineation of a contemplative practice that, if followed, um, had not only the possibility of a transformation of the human spirit and heart, but had 2,500 years of empirical proof that such a transformation would occur.
And so I wanted to make a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. You may ask why the term science, whereas my friend Mathieu Ricard here said to me, uh, what is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct observation, empirical observation as to the nature of mind? And many of you may know of Mathieu. He's an extraordinary figure. His father was France's most illustrious Descartian philosopher. His mother was a well-known painter. Mathieu, Mathieu himself was a molecular biologist studying in the lab of a Nobel laureate in Paris. He grew up in a house of luminaries. He learned photography from Cartier-Bresson, piano from Stravinsky, anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. But one day he realized that there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. And he went back to where he had always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan uh, monk. And with us on this journey was also a, a Tibetan Amshu doctor, a good friend of mine, Shara Barma, seen here rather quizzically examining my urine sample. And we began with the blessings of Trusa Grimpache, head of the Nyingma tradition at the monastery of Shiwang that clings like a swallow's nest on the edge of the mountains of Solokumbu um, in Nepal. And our quest into the mountains of the Himalaya was to experience not a hero, a Western hero, but rather an Eastern hero, a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva who had achieved enlightenment but remained in the realm of samsara to facilitate the liberation of other sentient beings. And so we began at the 18-day Mani Rimdu ceremony that commemorates the dissemination of the Dharma into Tibet by Padmasavala, Guru Rinpoche. And then we began this journey high into the mountains uh, to a nunnery where Sherab had been treating a remarkable woman. This is simply the most beautiful story. As a young girl, she wanted to pursue the Dharma. Her poverty forced her to become betrothed to a wealthy merchant. To escape him, she ran from her ceremony of, of, of marriage, crawled down a human latrine covered with excrement uh, turned up at the Temboche Monastery where the Lama cleaned her up and then dispatched her over the Nangpala Pass into Tibet where she became ordained as a Tibetan nun. And then she crossed back over the pass and she went into lifelong retreat. And for 45 years, she had lived in a single cell in her nunnery, uh, committing herself each day to the recitation of a single mantra. And because she was old, Shara was treating her and we had a chance to meet her. So as we moved up into the mountains, past the cave where Sherab spent one full year in meditative retreat, as outside Mathieu chanted the sutras, as we came closer and closer, this next photograph was taken as sunlight fell onto her face for the first time in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of her situation, from the Western perspective, what should have greeted us would have been a madwoman. Instead, the face that greeted us radiated loving compassion. She immediately took Mathieu to task for the unnecessarily baroque rituals of male-dominated monasteries. She immediately gave all benefit and credit for her spiritual practices to all sentient beings. This was a true Eastern hero. And as Mathieu said to me later, you know, uh, you know, this is the proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind of Tibetan Buddhism, the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And many months later, when I told this story to a Lama at a monastery in Tibet, he said something quite wonderful. He said, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so, of course, the Tibetan people leave it to the rest of us as they contemplate the lessons of the Diamond Sutra, that life is fleeting, like the dawn fading into the day. And they leave it to us to ask why can we continue to dominate, uh, accept the wrath of China, which has imposed a Western ideology invented by a German philosopher distilled in the British Library in a document that has caused agony throughout the world in its implementation, why we allow this ideology to still uh, dominate a spiritual worldview that has given so much to the world. And so in the end, even as we contemplate climate change, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of world do we wanna live in?
a monochromatic world of monotony or do we want to celebrate a polychromatic world of diversity? Do we want to wake one day to discover that the entire imagination of humanity has been reduced to a more narrow modality of thought, um, uh, such that our children forget that there were even other possibilities for life itself? And the reason this is so important is not an issue of human rights, certainly not an issue of nostalgia. It's about geopolitical survival, because if there's one lesson of anthropology, it is that culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. It's not the prayers we utter, the clothing we wear, the rituals we partake in. Ultimately, culture is about a body of moral and ethical values that every society places around each individual to keep barbarism at bay. The barbaric heart that history sadly shows us lies within all of us. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find order and meaning in the universe, to do what Lincoln said, seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, individuals from their own volition or through coercion aspire to levels of affluence in a system that invariably leaves them on the bottom rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere you just have to look at the points of chaos around the world every clash of violence is a story of culture here are the faces of the dead in the genocide museum in rwanda in kigali now if we slip into the high arctic we discover that the nation state has finally come to understand that these multiple voices of humanity don't threaten the nation state, they enrich it if the state's prepared to accept diversity. When the British arrived in the Arctic of my own country of Canada, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both turned out to be wrong. What the British failed to understand was that there was no better measure of human genius than the ability to survive in a harsh environment where everything had to be made forged by the cold. The original runners of the sleds were made of fish, three Arctic char laid in a row and wrapped in the skin of a caribou hide. Peter Freuchen, who traveled with the legendary Danish explorer Newton Rasmussen, famously quick, quipped that if you ran out of food, you could always eat your sled because the sleds were made of meat. Uh, a towel, a moist towel left out overnight became a shovel by dawn. This is a photograph I took polar bear hunting with the Inuit. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 degrees Celsius before the winds came up. They made an igloo. We slipped into the furs and we lit the oil lamps. Blood on ice, terrible as it is to say to an Indian audience, in the Arctic is actually not a sign of death. For the Inuit people, it's an affirmation of life itself. It's the only way they survive. And yet if a man takes a seal and refuses or fails to drop fresh water into its mouth, he will never hunt again. And indeed, there's a strong sense that as the animals must be protected, they must be hunted for their own well-being. Now, the tragedy in the Arctic, of course, is that the people have endured so much in a concentrated process of European contact and assimilation. There was virtually no European presence in the Arctic, save for the um, fleeting visits of explorers until the 1940s and 50s. Then came the welfare system, alcohol, uh, residential schools, any number of violations all of which the Inuit people in a remarkable way overcame. But there's one thing they can't overcome, and that is the impact of climate change. This is a photograph taken in the northernmost community in the world, in Northwest Greenland, called Kanak. Here, the ice used to come in in the month of, uh, of, of September and stay through July. Now the ice comes in November and is gone by March. The entire way of life of this extraordinary civilization of the northern ice is literally melting from beneath them. And I want to close this morning on a more hopeful story. In the immediate wake of 9-11, uh, when so much anti-Muslim hysteria was um, in the United States, I wanted to tell a story of the purity of Islam. And so we traveled to Mali in Africa, 
and we visited some of the great sites, including the city of Timbuktu, which is sort of a, a port on the Sea of Sand that is the Southern Sahara. And we wanted to remind people that at a time when London and Paris were mud hovels, Timbuktu was one of the great centers of Islamic learning, equivalent to Damascus or Cairo or Baghdad. And that the very knowledge of the, re of the ancient Greeks only survived to inform the European Renaissance because the knowledge was held as a repository by the great scholars of the Muslim, North African and African world. In Timbuktu, you can hold in your hand documents that date to the 10th century, documents embossed in gold that cover all the range of the sciences, the humanities and philosophy. And we also wanted to travel north into the desert, a thousand kilometers along an ancient route that once carried gold to Europe. Until the discovery of the new world, two thirds of Europe's gold came from equatorial West Africa, from the great kingdoms of Mali and, and Dahomey, 52 days through Timbuktu across the deserts uh, to, in passing, a salt mine called Taudeni, which where salt has been dug from the earth for 800 years, but it is not seen as a condiment. It is the sacred essence of the earth. A young man from the Berber, the Tamachek peoples, cannot marry if he has not completed this ordeal, this pilgrimage, this caravan, to the mine, 20 days across the desert each way, 40 days under the searing sun. At the mine itself, one encounters a biblical scene. Uh, a friend of mine, Isa Muhammad, a great Torah, said, I would not bring my wife here. I asked some of the men where they came from, and they said, there are no nations here. And while we're at the mine, these great slabs of salt that once traded ounce for ounce with gold um, because they represent the essence of the Sahara. The journey to the mine hones the spiritual devotion of the young man. And two incredible things unfolded. I met this individual in a hut of salt blocks. He lived in the sand. The only possessions he had was a tattered rags on his body and a bucket of rusted bucket of brackish water by his side. Chronologically, he was younger than me, but physically his body was crushed. He had been caught in debt servitude, debt peonage, uh, by having to borrow money in his community from a wealthy merchant to save the life of his child. To pay off that debt, he worked in the mine, but he was never going to escape his peonage. When I did a calculation as to what his productivity was, chipping the, sand, the salt from beneath the desert and the time he had left and what he got paid for each slab, it was very clear to me that he was never going to escape. And in the 800 year history of the mine, he was the only one known to stay out there through all seasons when the sand is said to virtually melt from the heat of the sun. And it turned out that his entire debt was less than the cost of a dinner for four in New York. And so my friend and I, who was with me, quietly handed him that money. He blessed Allah. He thanked us. And then as we walked away, a yellow cloud of sand swept in front of us. A sandstorm obliterated all sense of him and the hut he lived in. And he, we never found out whether, in fact, he was telling us the truth. Did he escape his debt and get back to his family? Or was he killed for the money? We never knew. But on our way south, back to Timbuktu, we came upon a caravan we had met going north. And in the desert, if the salt gets wet, it cracks and loses all value. And an unusual thunderstorm had broken open the Sahara sky. And so we came upon this entire caravan, uh, several young men, multiple camels, all the wealth of their family, and they had had to stop to allow the salt to dry out. Well, there's no margin of error in this pilgrimage, 20 days each way. And so here were five or six men, 250 kilometers from the nearest well, forced to sit still 
and they were down to one liter of water. Now in the Sahara, you can live for two weeks without food. Death by dehydration comes overnight. There's a, sign, a saying amongst the truck smugglers of, of Mauritania that the great thing about brake fluid is that it keeps you off the battery acid. And as we came upon these young boys, this photograph I took as one of them was marching off 25 kilometers into the desert where they thought there was a place where they might be able to dig for water. But as we came upon their encampment, what was the very first thing they did? They kindled a twig fire and began to brew us tea with their last liter of water. Honoring the adage of the Bedouin that you will kill the goat that gives the milk that keeps your children alive to feed a wandering stranger who comes to your tent in the middle of the night, cold, hungry, thirsty, in need of help. Because you never know when you will be that stranger, desperate for human comfort, desperate for human support. And I promise you that as I watch Muhammad pour me, and I took this photograph as he poured me a cup of tea from that precious amount of water that they had, I thought to myself, not only is this the reason I became an anthropologist, but it's moments like these that allow all of us to hope. Thank you very much.